Today is a sad day because we're moving on from CS Graphs. I know they're beautiful, but sometimes you just gotta move on and we have other stuff to talk about. Hello everybody, I'm Farrar and today we're gonna be talking about dynamic programming. Previously we were focused on a lot of graph theory like traversing graphs with VFS and DFS, but today we're gonna be talking about dynamic programming, which isn't exactly an algorithm, but it's more of an algorithmic approach. So it's like a strategy. You basically take the strategy of dynamic programming in order to solve problems. So Geeks for Geeks has a pretty good definition. It's basically an optimization over plane recursion where you basically store all your previous recursion so that in the future you can just look back at the other things and you could use them in the future. In my terminology, it's just store stuff, use stuff later. That's basically how it goes down with dynamic programming. It's basically recursion. So today I'm going to be talking about a lot of dynamic programming examples because the best way to learn dynamic programming is seeing examples and know where you could apply it. And because I'm going to go through all these problems, I recommend you pause the video, think about the problem that I'm putting forward, and then watch how I solve it if you weren't able to get it. The main thing about dynamic programming or DP is knowing how to apply the recursion. So just practicing how to find the recursion is the main thing you got to do. So let's start with a couple examples. These are not super hard to come by, but like, they're good examples. So we mentioned the Fibonacci sequence, right? Let's see how we would do that with dynamic programming. Alright, we have our lovely identity where f then. The nth Fibonacci number is equal to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. If you watch my intro to algorithm video, you probably know that doing this with normal CS recursion is a pretty bad idea. So let's say that you try to find the 6th Fibonacci sequence number thing, yeah. Then you would have to find the 5th and the 4th one, right? But then to find the 5th one, you'd have to find the 4th and the 3rd one. And then the 4th would be 2nd and 3rd. And you can see, we're finding the 4th one twice, we're finding the 3rd one twice, and we're just repeating a ton of work. Just not efficient at all. So, we gotta think of a smarter way. We did that in the intro to algorithms courses, but there's another way to do it, using dynamic programming. So instead of resolving for each previous Fibonacci sequence and finding the same thing multiple times, we can just store everything. Because if we store it, we don't want to solve it again. So let's say that we want to find the nth Fibonacci number, right? And then let's say that we make an array with n numbers, such that the ith number is the ith Fibonacci number. Then we would start with our array, right? And we would start with 0 and 1. And then we can say, hey, to fill out our third element of this array, we just sum the previous two. So we do, for this is a index 2, we do index 1 plus index 0. And then we get 2. I know how to add 0 plus 1 is 1, I swear. Bruh. Literally on last year's Amy, I did 121 plus 1 equals 123. Big brain. But anyway, we're not talking about how bad I am at math. We're going to be talking about how to add numbers. Yeah. So we can see that there's like an obvious recursion here, right? Array of i is equal to array i minus 1 plus array i minus 2. So we just did 2, right? We move on to 3, that's 2. Move on to 4, 4, that's 3. Move on to 5, that's 5. Move on to 6, that's 8. And the only thing we're doing is we're just looping through this array and we're just adding the two previous ones. So basically this takes only n time, right? We only had to look at two things, that's constant time, and we do that n times from going from 0 to n. So eventually we just keep doing this until we get to the nth Fibonacci number and even once we find the nth Fibonacci number, we still have all the other Fibonacci numbers just waiting there for us. It's crazy. So basically just generating this array is dynamic programming. You're storing everything previously so that you can just quickly access it without having to redo any work in the future. Alrighty, let's try another example with math. Okay, let's just say theoretically you want to find out what 723 is, right? So basically if you're smart, you would just do 7 factorial over 3 factorial, 4 factorial. But unfortunately computers are not as smart. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But the problem with this is that for computers, 7 factorial takes n time, right? It takes, you gotta go 7 times 5, 6 times 5 times 4, and that's just not efficient. So the way that computers like to do it is to use recursion. So basically how computers solve this is they divide this into 6 choose 2 and 6 choose 3. And this is basically called Pascal's identity. 6 choose 2 plus 6 choose 3 is equal to 7 choose 3. And then we can further decompose this into 5 choose 1 and 5 choose 2. But we know that every number choose 1 is just itself. So this is basically our base case. And then this could be divided into 4 choose 1 and 4 choose 2 and then that would have a base case and we keep going until we get all our base cases filled. But the problem is that we're going to ultimately be doing, reading a lot of work because this goes into 5 choose 2 and 5 choose 3. Repeated work. What? What do we do when we have repeated work? We use dynamic programming. So the way that dynamic programming prevents this is it basically stores everything. So let's say that you want to find all the n choose k where n is less than some number and k is less than some number. So to solve this with dynamic programming, basically what we do is we make an n plus 1 by k plus 1 array. 
such that array ij is equal to i choose j, like you see on the screen. The reason why we do n plus 1 by k plus 1 is because arrays are weird, right? Like it goes from 0 to n. So if we want n choose k, we have to go from 0 to n, right? Wait, that means in fact we can just make the 0 to n because that's like better. Alrighty, so for example, if we wanted to do n goes from 0 to 2 and k goes from 0 to 2, we'd make a 3 by 3 array. Alright, so we have a 3 by 3 array and then we fill it in, right? So 0 to 0 is 1, 0 to 1 is 0, 0 to 2 is 0, and then 1 to 0 is 1, 1 to 1 is 1, and then 1 to 2 is 0. Then move into the next row, we've got 2 to 1, 2 to 0 is 1, 2 to 1 is 2, and then 2 to 2 is 1. And you can see how it looks, right? There's a Pascal's triangle, wow! So how do we do this using DP, right? So first off first, what do we know about chooses? We know immediately that anything to 0 is 1, right? And then at the same time, we know that anything to itself is also 1, right? So we immediately set this whole column, this whole column over here, to 1. And we set this whole diagonal here to 1. And then we know that everything where the denominator is greater than the numerator is just 0. So we set all these guys to 0. So, in order to solve the dynamic program, you just loop through the array. You go to 0, 0. Is n equal to k? Or is k equal to 0? Yeah, so we set it to 1. Alright, we move on to the next one. Is n equal to k or is k equal to 0? No, but k is greater than n, so we just set it to 0. And then we keep going, we do all the same things, we go all the same things, then we get to this 2, right? And let's say we are like, is k equal to 0? No. Is n equal to k? No. So it's not a 1. Alright, is k greater than n? No, because it's 2, 2 is 1, right? So, what we basically do is that we add the previous two. So for array ij, we basically set it to array i minus 1, j minus 1, plus array i minus 1, j. So for this 2, we would look at array i minus 1, j minus 1, which is 1, and then array i minus 1, j, which is 1. We add them together and we get 2. So basically, we're able to solve everything in constant time, and we just had to do it n times k time. We just had to fill out this whole array, and then, well, blam it, we got n choose k. And at the same time, we got all the other chooses. So if you want to generate a lot of chooses, and you don't want to have to, like, do all the work every single time you want to generate a choose, then this is perfect. All right, enough math. We're here for CS, okay? How is it applicable to CS? Well, a lot of musical use problems ask you for, like, something that uses DP, and the applications are not always obvious, right? So the first CS application we're going to look at is find the maximum sum of a subset of n integers such that no two elements of a subset are consecutive. All right, so think about this and pause the video so you can think about this before I go over the solution, but the solution is pretty legit. All right, just to explain what a non-consecutive subset basically is, is so that if you have like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, your sum can't be like 1 plus 2 plus 3. It has to be like 1 plus 3 plus 5. See, none of the two are consecutive, but if we did like 1 plus 3 plus 4, that wouldn't be valid because like they'd be consecutive. That's not, not okay. So first let's try to solve this by ourselves, right? Let's see. So we could do 6. That makes sense. We want to get that. We want to get a 4. And we want to get a 2. And I think that's the biggest one, right? 12. 12 is their answer. But how would a computer do this? Like, there's so many different subsets that you could take that like, you can't try all of them, that wouldn't work. So the first step to solving a DP problem is recognizing the recurrence. So this recurrence is kind of cool. Let's first see. In order to define a recurrence, the first thing you gotta do is identify what you're recursing on, right? Like, what are you trying to solve? So in dynamic programming, this is called a state. And the state is basically the maximum sum of a subset of the first k integers. So we only consider one. The maximum sum of a subset of 1 is just 1, right? Because we can just take 1. It's not consecutive with anything, so that's fine. So in our recursion, our the first thing is 1, right? So the maximum sum of the first two integers, 1 and 2, is quite clearly 2, right? Because we can't take both of them, otherwise they'd be consecutive, so just 2. So what about the maximum sum of the first three? Well, we could just see that it's 3 plus 1. Because if you took the 2, you can't take anything else. So 3 plus 1 is the best. So 4, and then I'll fill out the rest. So eventually, we got to our nth term, and we saw that our best answer is 12. So hooray, we're done. So how would we recurse in order to do this? Key thing to note here is that we could either put something in our subset, or we could not put it in our subset. So let's try this with a different array, because right now, this is not really interesting, right? This is just an array of increasing numbers. We gotta randomize this. So let's say we have like 2, 3, 1, 4, 6, 5. All right, so obviously the first one's 2. And obviously the second one is 3. But what about this one? We can either take the 3 or we could take a 1 and a 2. So 1 and 2 is good. Alright, let's say that we take a 4, right? Let's say that we have a 4. 
then we cannot take our 1. But we could take any subset of 2 and 3. But we already found the maximum subset over there. We said that the maximum subset is 3. So, if we took a 4, then the maximum we could get is 4 plus 3, which is 7. Let's say we didn't take the 4. Then we could take any subset of the first 3. Wow! But we already found that. We already found that that's 3. We already found that the maximum subset of the first 3 is 3. So clearly it's better to take the 4 and then take a subset of 2 and 3. And we found that that's 7, so this just becomes 7. Alright, let's try to try with 6. So let's say we take a 6. Then we can take a 4, but we can take any subset of 2, 3, and 1. And we found that the max of that is 3. So 6 plus 3 is 9. Well, how do we don't take the 6? Then we could take any subset of the first four and we found that the max of that is seven. So what's the max of nine and seven? Nine. So the answer would be nine over here. And then finally, we could do it for five. So we could either take the five, that means we can't take the six, and we can take any subset of the first four. We know that the sum, the best is seven. So we do seven plus five is 12. And we compare it to nine, because if we didn't take the five, then we could take any subset of the first five. So which is greater, 12 or five? We see that the answer is just 12. So our ultimate answer is just 12. Very cool. Alright, so did you see what we were doing? We're basically saying if we take it, we could take a subset from the first n minus 2 term. So, for example, if we're trying to find the fourth term, we're basically saying we could either take 4 plus the max of these two, or we could take the max of these three. So, just writing this out here, we could basically say that dpi is equal to the max of, let's say that the array is a and our dp is dp, ai plus dpi minus 2, or just taking dpi minus 1. And now, we have a recursion, we have our array, we know how to find the ith position in the array using the previous stuff in the array. So basically all we do is we loop through the array and apply this recursion. Just like how we did it for this example array. So that's exactly how the algorithm works. Alrighty. If you understand DP already just by looking at one example, then you're just insanely good at CS, but I didn't understand it until I had like a lot of examples. So, let's go through another example. Find the number of ways to tile a 1 by n grid using only 1 by a and 1 by b block. So our 1 by n grid kind of looks like this. So let's say that n is 6 and then a is 1 and b is 2. So we want to tile this 1 by 6 grid with a 1 by 1 and a 1 by 2. So now, let's just say that we're recursing on the ways to fill up a 1 by k grid. So we can start by filling up just a 1 by 1 grid. So the only way to fill up the 1 by 1 grid is to put in a 1 by 1 block. So there's one way to do that. For the 2 by 1, however, you can either put a 2 by 1 block in or you can put two 1 by 1 blocks in. So there's two ways to do that. For 3, let's say you put a 1 by 1 block over here. Then, in the remaining spot, you could either put a 2 by 1 or two 1 by 1. So there's two ways for that, but let's say that we put a 2 by 1 instead at the end. Then there's only one way to fit in a 1 by 1. So it's 2 plus 1 is 3. Alright, what about for this one? So let's say that we put a 1 by 1 block here. Then, how many ways are there to tile the remaining part? What? Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We already solved it. We already said that there's three ways to do that. So there's three ways to do that, right? But let's say that we put a 2 by 1 block here. <gasps> Then we had a tile remaining spots. How many ways are there to do that? We already found it! Two! So 3 plus 2 is just 5. So this goes 5 over here. And then, using the same logic, is 5 plus 3 is 8. And then 8 plus 5 is 13. Holy moly, we just solved the problem using recursion. You can literally notice that it's a Fibonacci sequence right here. And all that came down to is realizing that to find how many ways there are to find the kth way to tile a 1 by k grid, you either put a 1 by 1 block and find how many ways there are to put the remaining, or you can put a 2 by 1 block and figure out how many ways there are to tile the remaining blocks from there. Very cool. So our dp would basically be dpi is equal to dpi minus 1 plus dpi minus 2. Epic. DP is really cool, like, it's literally the one problem that I could solve very, very, very consistently. Alright, let me just code up an example real quick so that you guys, like, have a concrete example of what to go off of. Alright, I coded up real quick, so basically, I have our int n, a, and b, we have our dp, we see in our n, a, and b, we set our dp 0 to 1, because if you have no blocks, there's only one way to do it, by not putting any tiles in, and then, we basically loop through our dp. We start from 1, and we basically say, if we can fit in our A block, let's try putting it in there, and then fill in, and then find out how many ways there are to fill in the remaining spot. If we can fit in our B block like this, then we add in the ways to fill in the remaining phase, which is a DP I minus B. And then eventually we finish our whole array, and then at the very end, we just print out the nth DP, because DP I is just equal to the ways to fill out a 1 by I grid. So if we just put in our example test case, 62612 is what we did. 13, just like we expected. All right, very cool. That's basically all I got to say for dynamic programming. If you guys want me to do more examples, I'm sure you guys do because dynamic programming is such a 
like abstract concept and doing examples is just the best way to get good at it just let me know because i'm really willing to do it and i have a lot of good examples up my sleeves my non-existent sleeves so the best way to get better at dp is to go through usico problems that use it or to just like think of examples on your own think of things that might use recursion so yeah that's it thank you guys for watching as always if you enjoyed the video leave a like and hit that subscribe button for more if you guys want more of these crash courses let me know down in the comments other than that thank you guys for watching and see you guys next time